Good, thank you. Thank you, Sam, for the, for the invitation. Uh, you said it's going to be interdisciplinary, quite so. Uh, I will be talking a little about uh, smart grids or distributed generation. I will talk about the problems of a country that has to double its capacity every 10 years. It was said before that the U.S. is flat on energy growth. We are 5 6% a year, so every year we have to double generation, transmission, and distribution, which is quite a challenge. And essentially, I'm going to share some of the problems of a sophisticated regulation that is not working nowadays, essentially because of social and environmental problems. Um, well, you have the abstract. I will discuss the economic, social, and political challenges of our country uh, that have to double that capacity, as I mentioned. I will go into the description of the regulation, very sophisticated, original, long, long lead regulation that, that worked very well for many years until we faced a shock and we've been having problems and problems since then. And I like that takeaway concept uh, that was uh, my previous uh, lecturer mentioned, so I just included these takeaways. Essentially, I will talk about sophisticated electricity market regulation that are not enough. I will say that electric power system infrastructure development is not anymore dependent just on technical and economical issues, and it is increasingly dependent on environmental and social issues, as we are really in deep trouble with that. So the grid of the future will be conditioned by those conflicting forces. And of course, government policy, government regulation will have to find ways to balance them. We are not really finding them nowadays. We're talking about a very tiny electricity system in the stream south of uh, South America. The main system on, 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 on covering most of the country is only 12,000 megawatt installed capacity. The northern system, which feeds the mining industry, is only 4,500. So it's a very small system. Hydrothermal system in, in the south, a lot of hydroelectricity. G coal system in the north, essentially thermal, no water resources. And, of course, a country that is growing. It's growing very fast. We are nowadays at $15,000 per capita income a year, and we really want to get there in, into 20,000. We are here, this is shows electricity consumption and uh, GDP per capita, the US there, high con electricity consumption, high GDP, Europe, Japan, the OECD over there, the rest of the world this way, and Chile going very fast from here to here to here. But of course, we, we are aiming, not maybe there, but probably there. So we need, we need to grow, we need to grow economically, industrially, uh, and therefore, we need more, more energy. Unfortunately, sorry, unfortunately, we are very dependent on our energy matrix. The primary energy consumption is over 72% dependent from abroad. We don't have oil, we don't have gas, we don't have coal. We, we only have biofuels and we have hydro. So we are very depending on how prices evolve abroad, uh, and that has been there for a long time. We didn't use gas before. We just relied on, on, on coal and, 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 and oil. Nowadays, it's an increasing, of course, resource. So this is the index of my presentation, a pioneering reform in electricity public policy. System design, the components, very sophisticated, mar location on marginal costs, uh, tolls for transmission, emphasizing location, etc. What things are coming? Renewables, new transmission expansion concepts, contract auctions. What, how it has worked? The market shock, we, we started back in 2004. And a very brief uh, mention of the role of the man and smart grids. Chile really was the deregulation pioneer. We started it back in 1982, long before Great Britain and the Margaret Thatcher did it in 1989. Of course, in California in 1998. In Latin America, it was Chile, Argentina, then Colombia, then Peru. It was really very strong in the area. But really, we had no previous experience to lean on, and we defined our regulation based on what we thought was the need. And essentially, the need was to structure, to segment the structure of the power sector. We had vertically integrated generation, transmission, and distribution companies, often owned by the state and developed by the state. We wanted to introduce competition in generation. That was the essence of the regulation. And for that, we had to segment and separate uh, competitive activities from, of course, monopolistic activities. The market was going to drive development. And of course, we had to regulate uh, wires, the, the monopolistic component. And of course, after that, it was a state-owned company, we privatized. So it's the private sector that drives, through market competition, the development of the system. What are the components of system design? Essentially, we look at different objectives. 
We wanted sufficiency in the long term, sufficient supply infrastructure, efficient supply uh, and infrastructure. We wanted efficiency, of course, in the short term. We didn't want to have any market power, if possible. And of course, we had to adjust the, uh, the contracts and the minimum dispatch costs. So essentially for that, we emphasize very much long-term energy contracts. As I will say later, our market is fully contracted, 100% contracted. The spot, the spot market is only for differentials. So we introduce a compulsory pool and audited costs, and we introduce, of course, the spot transfers among the generators, the balancing, and we introduce a capacity charge. The market operation is made by the independent system operator, operator base, as in the old times, on audited costs. It includes the run of river hydro, the, the storage of water, the coal, the gas, the diesel, etc. And it has a medit order list, as in the old times, and depending on demand, it balances the, the market and it defines the hourly spot price. Generator supply, and that's a different component as well that we introduced long ago and is being considered worldwide as a needed component. We do not only sell energy as generators, we supply energy hourly, energy gigawatt hours per hour. We also gener generators supply capacity. We define a new product, which is the ability, ability to supply peak demand. So you are paid not only for the hourly energy that you supply at your contracted or spot price value, but you also are paid for the capacity. The capacity uh, is, it has an economic logic essentially based in, in economies of the, the French economics, uh, economists of the 1950s, essentially Watteau, who indicated that if we have marginal tariffs for, uh, co for capacity and for energy, and you pay generators for that, it would be enough to pay for investment cost of capital operation. So we have the concept of firm capacity or sufficiency capacity, which is assigned to each generation uh, plant uh, according to its expected availability. It's an ex ante analysis in which every year by December you say, how is this generator going to contribute to peak demand that will be paid by demand and it will be transferred to generators. And of course, if you are a hydro generator, you cannot reliable, su reliably supply more than your driest year, historical driest year of capacity. So that's essentially a component that has been very relevant to support investment and supply, of, co of course, peaking capacity. That is, for example, uh, this year, all th 30 of the main generators in the system, how much capacity is considered to them. Uh, 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 genera hydro generators that have the capability to store water, of course, have the highest capacity recognition. If you would have, there are no wind generators, but probably wind generator has almost no capacity, cannot really reliably supply in advance for the peaking area. Second concepts, spot market, contract market. A generator may sign, sign a power purchase agreement with a third party and all sell energy to the spot market. So we have a spot market, which is the real operation where the system operator defines who operates, who generates, therefore determines the spot price, and of course, you can sell at the spot price. But most really go through what we call, I would call a commercial operation. You sell through contracts that have nothing to do with operation. The real operation is independent of contracts and you sell through PPAs to uh, consumers. And of course, uh, you have to balance. You have the spar market, which has energy and capacity. You have an hourly uh, uh, r r uh, determined uh, energy price, and we have a regulated capacity price. Only generators can participate in the spot market. There would be an opportunity there for demand, but we haven't opened that. And then the contract market, which are really financial contracts. You supply energy to a generator, and you will be, you're paid monthly, yearly for that, uh, and it's a relevant financial instrument for investors, and of course it stabilizes prices for the client. And then you have to do a balance, of course. Let's say you contracted that energy, and you are asked to generate that or that. So you may generate less, you'll be deficit, or you generate more, you'll have a surplus. The spot market balancing hour by hour, done by the system operator, is the one who tells who has to pay who for the differences. Of course, if you, if you fix, fix a price for that, you, you take a risk, depending on what will be the spot price for that energy. Generation fully contracted. Demand buying through long-term PPA contracts, 15 years, like distribution companies, 20 years for mining, the mining industry. And of course, the investment is often based on contracts. The bank financing is made feasible by these PPAs. 
And of course, the new, the new, the newcomers can really competition is really not on the spot market because it's, it's cost based. The, the real the competition is really on the contracts, how contracts are uh, obtained or not. Although we are we are not very happy that competition has increased. It's essentially a few base an oligopoly, a few players in each of the system. So the spot market is really a balance for, for differences, uh, but by being cost-based, it el eliminates market power by design. The market competition state place at the PPA market, not in the spot. Here you have, for one company, Endesa, how over 2008 to 2012 has been buying or selling energy in the, in the spot market to balance its contracts. Second very important component, transmission and prices. We have, since the very start of our market, nodal prices, location and marginal pricing. A big discussion in the US, you evolve into that. In the US, they are not there. They are working with regional prices. We essentially wanted to reflect generation costs. We wanted to reflect losses. And we wanted to reflect system conge congestion. Any consumer or any generator has to realize where it is. If it's in the south of the country or, in, or near the load center, it has a different condition. Therefore, it has to recognize the structure of costs of the market, and therefore that is transferred through these nodal prices. Where you have, uh, if you have congestion to the north of the system, then you have very high prices here. The markets decouple because there is no uh, economic energy to supply locally. There is the history of congestions uh, over the last three years. In a few lines, we have congestions. We are, we're investing in them. But the prices are there and are affecting the players. Third element, to go with the, with the, with the local location or marginal pricing, we have open access. The system is considered as a whole transmission system. It has to be paid by all the players. And we have a transmission control scheme that also reflects locational impact. If you are in the south of the country, you pay much more tolls than you are next to the load. We don't have a, a postage stamp scheme. Uh, we have a transmission remuneration, reg fully regulated, and the main, the main part of the system is essentially paid 80% by generation and 20% by load. We have added new elements into <coughs> our regulation. What I'm talking about is essentially regulation developed in the late 80s and the early 90s. Of course, the market has evolved, and, and we, we found that some of our original re regulation was not working appropriately, so we started introducing regulations. For example, the non-conventional, this trend worldwide. Let's, let's give more possibilities to, non to renewables. We call it non-conventional renewable energy, essentially to leave out large hydro, because our system is very renewable, but it's mostly made with large hydro. So we only consider non-conventional as those plants be below 20 megawatts, biomass, wind, uh, 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 geothermal, solar, etc. Essentially, we define a quota starting in 2010 of 5% that will be frozen until 2014, and then it will grow up to 10% by 2024. No, no feeding tariff, essentially a quota. If you sell energy, you have to prove every year to the system operator that you are fulfilling. Part of the energy you're selling comes from your renewables. Otherwise, you pay uh, uh, fine. I won't go into any of those details. I imagine these presentations will be available uh, later on. So this has really made an incredible uh, expansion of possibilities. This is the northern system. And look at all the solar places where investors from Spain, from the US, can come to the country and look for opportunities. Of course, these are all projects. Very few are taking place, essentially because they cannot compete, the costs are high. And, and, and they have the difficulty of, of course, signing contracts. But th there's a big interest, several thousand megawatts in the north uh, looking for that. And, but the obligation has been working. This is essentially the obligation, and this is the supply. And as you see, as, uh, as we started in 2011, we're fully committing. But of course, it's very small now, still nowadays. It's only uh, less than 5% as this is growing. Second, uh, com second new component, auctions, auctions for supply. We originally had a regulated price for final consumers through distribution companies. Investors in generation said, that is not enough for me. I want something different. So we define a set of auctions very much alike uh, Brazil. I, I would, I would, I would, those interested in auctions should look at that experience. We have some papers on this area. Essentially, we had, we'll, we'll call distribution companies to call international auctions for supply. Uh, of energy, and uh, this uh, started back in 2005, and essentially gives a really stable signal for investment in generation. 
and it's, uh, uh, and, and it's, it's, it's long-term supply contracts, 15 years, it's, and it has worked quite well. Uh, we have an open and competitive breeding process. 100% of demand must be contracted by distribution companies at all times. They cannot buy in the spot price. Uh, and uh, they essentially contract base and variable energy supply. Third new component that we had to change, we had a market-based expansion scheme which wasn't working. It was only, only lines that related to a specific generation were, were working, so we decided to go into central planning. Central planning directed by the state with participation from generators, transmission, distribution, and large consumers. And essentially every four years we, we do a centralized planning exercise uh, of how do we expand the system for the next 10 years and define investments for the next uh, four years. So based on expected generation, investment, expected new load. And then we define two, two types of expansions. One, the expansion of existing facilities. So that those expansions we gave them to the incumbent, to the transmission company that, is, that owns those facilities. And we, we, told that, we tell that company to call for an auction or for an international tender to build that. But we assign that to the incumbent, to the existing transmission company. What is original of our scheme is that any new facilities, any new lines, any 500 KB lines are not given to the existing transmission company. We call for an international tender who wants to build this transmission line in the country. And for example, uh, this last year we had several, uh, these are uh, almost uh, $900 million of investment uh, in, in, the, in the near future that had to be assigned to uh, callers. Actually, the, the, the incumbent, the main transmission company, did not participate in this tender. And we had co companies from the US, from Brazil, from Colombia. Colombia company ISA was assigned some expansion. Very economic prices being offered for the building of this uh, expansion of transmission line. That has worked quite well. Results, the system has evolved. This is the main system, the installed capacity. Uh, a, a compound annual growth rate of 5.8% of investment, quite high. And that is load, and that is technologies, uh, hydro generation, coal, uh, oil, uh, natural gas, which started coming in the late 90s from Argentina. Uh, and then uh, um, um, LNG started coming as well. And look at the backup capacity, 30%, 35%, an important capacity uh, responding with investment to this, uh, need, the needs of the country. The same happened in the north. In the north, we don't have water, so we essentially have coal. We have natural gas. Here, it was crazy. Competition brought investment to two times, more than two times what was needed by demand. And of course, that is adjusting. But we, we really, and the, the rate of growth was 9.4%, we had investment coming and developing the system. But we had a market shock. And the market shock started in 2004. Essentially, what happened, we all went for gas, Argentina, a neighboring country with assumedly enormous amounts of reserves of gas, very economic, started supplying through different gas pipelines Chile to Chile, and we went all for it. We'll, we thought it was an independent, uh, sorry, an infinite supply at very low prices. We stopped investing in hydro, investing in coal. We went into gas, and then we had the Argentinian economic uh, crash uh, in, in the, in the, in the 2000, 2003. And they started, although we had international agreements that if any problems or arose, they would cut supply of gas both to Argentina and Chile. It was not politically feasible, so they started cutting gas to us from 30% to almost 95% of the gas they were supplying before. And of course, spot prices just climbed. So we really had that problem. Uh, and therefore, although I said investment grew well, generation grew well, we had to resort to diesel. From one day to the other, we had no gas. We could not invest in the new coal plants. There was no time for that. Fortunately, those uh, combined cycle plants were, uh, di were dual, so we started burning diesel. Previously, we had only had problems with droughts, like, like here, the 1998, 1998. Never had a problem before with this, uh, this supply of this, of this fuel. And of course, we didn't have energy terminals. We could not import it. We have them now. So that risk is, is, is gone away. In the north, the same. The, the system, this was all combined cycle. We, we almost stopped uh, uh, building coal, but we had to resort to diesel. And of course, the, the beautiful times of the $25 per megawatt hour energy wholesale 
went up to 350. Crazy, really crazy. But of course, prices are there. You say, I mean, why that didn't the government intervene and freeze prices? No, I mean, that's the way the system market works. And of course, the large consumers are the ones suffering the more. The, the, the regulated consumers, the whole consumer have stable prices. Of course, prices have gone up. But look at, look at the, 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 this is the, en the, the energy note. Sorry, this is the regulated price uh, by, for, to final consumers. This is the mean market price, and that's the spot price. And of course, we went away from that, and now we're talking about market prices for final consumers with values over $100 per megawatt hour. As, 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 which is very expensive for the region, very expensive for us that are competing with neighboring countries on exports and where energy is a big component. In the northern system, the same. Values around $25 and going to values around $125 at the market level. Well, over those problems, we started evol evolving as a society in other areas. Environmental issues became relevant. We, in, in, grew, we developed a new environmental regulation in 1994. We started increasing the requirements for emissions. For example, the local emissions regulation for coal plants is, is really, this is uh, SO2, NOx, P, uh, PM, and you see Chile at the very bottom of the, of the, of the, requir of the requirement. Very, very little contributions required to new power plants and of course to adjust the old ones. So we went into that. We're very concerned on our CO2 footprint, although Chile, in comparison to the United States, China, or even India, is a very minute contributor to global warming, 0.2% of global emissions. We're quite concerned that our emissions are growing considerably, and that in the future, the footprint, the CO2 footprint, may be against us. If we export wine, Maybe in the U.S. or in the U.K., they will look at the footprint of that wine and will say, no, we, want the, we don't want that wine. Although as a country, you are not contributing to global warming, you are imposing a lot of CO2 emissions into your products. So it is a growing concern. But over that, I would say the new problems to us are the social problems. We, we have a new context. Society, population are participating. We have opposition from local communities that do not see the benefits of building a big coal plant or a big hydro plant. Uh, and nationally, you, you see environmental movements being very successful and collecting thousands of people along the main streets of Santiago to oppose a 2,750 megawatt hydro plant in Patagonia. It's going to flood Patagonia. It's a very minute plant, but it's going to flood Patagonia. No to coal plants. Uh, Suez, go home. Uh, investors coming into the country, Brazilian investors coming to the country, and the population saying, no, we don't want that public re relation to coal fire plants and to large hydro. But not only that, they are reject rejecting wind plants, indigenous communities rejecting wind plants, indigenous communities re re rejecting geothermal plants, um, and then also institutional problems. The Supreme Court, only last August, rejecting a 2,000 megawatt coal plant in the north because it didn't comply with environmental requirements, although assumed it was at all fully uh, complying with the law, but the uh, Supreme Court comes in and says no, responding to society. The government actually questioning the Supreme Court, a conflict between uh, executive and legislative power. And of course, this has an international dimension. You from the U.S. are very responsible for this as well. If you, if you help Greenpeace, if you help international rivers, they are very active in the region. These environmental issues are becoming global issues. Uh, Robert Kennedy sending a letter to the, our president said, stop uh, this Patagonia hydro plant. Uh, David Cameron going to, into Brazil opposing a large hydro plant that they are planning in Brazil. It's become an international, an international problem. And of course, the other, the other issue I'm most concerned is to become a political issue. This is a session of Congress, a very, a very elegant session of Congress and a group of, uh, of uh, congressmen saying no to Patagonia uh, power plants. Even religious, it's becoming even religious. You, you are a believer or you are not. You are a believer in full renewable society or you are a believer in full cold, dirty uh, generation. And of course, along with that, there's been a new push for renewables. Environmental groups have pushed that we, 10% for 2024 20, 20, is not enough. We want, along the European lines, 20% for 2020. I don't know how we're going to get there, at what cost, but that's what they're pushing. They even have a project of law. Of course, they are, they are, fee, they are fed with fantastic opportunities we have with renewables in Chile. Look at the solar energy radiation. Let's look at 
Las Be uh, Frankfurt, where they have a lot of, uh, of, uh, of uh, solar radiation. The kilowatt hour per square meter, 3.56. Look at Las Vegas, 8. And look at Kalama, 8.80. .80. We're supposed to have along North Africa some of the best places for solar energy. So, of course, stimulated by this, let's go for 20, 2020. And, um, and look at the, uh, unfortunately, fantastic uh, hourly demand radiation, but look at the load in the northern system, and look at the solar supply. Fantastic. Very economic energy here. What do we do about, what do we do about that, uh, those uh, areas? Besides that, the system operator in the north saying, we cannot include more than 450 megawatts of solar energy and 100 megawatts of wind energy. We only have coal plants. How do we respond to changes of that? Not only a question of storage, but a question of response uh, to, 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 to load, to, to supply changes. And unfortunately, at least for Chile, uh, the non-renewable conventional energies are not competitive. The hydro plants are the best, but they are being opposed by the country. The coal fire are quite, well, geothermal and small hydro are good, Coal, coal fire comes, and then LNG comes even later. We receive very expensive gas there. And solar, uh, et cetera, come much, much, much higher. Of course, this uh, photovoltaic solar is, is really going that way. It's going up. We have really a, a, a plummeting of the photovoltaic solar. Uh, so that, that may change. So very fast. I'm sorry, but uh, I, I wanted to leave for quest questions and discussion. Role of the man. Very little, very little. We assume that uh, demand is passive. It will not have, we, we have some information from the past when we started having these price shocks that somehow demand started reducing. There is really uh, a response. There is, there is a, uh, um, demand is, is, is depending on, on price, uh, uh, finally. But essentially, we assume it has a passive role. The challenge for the country is to supply all the, the energy that the demand has. And we have had some attempts to stimulate demand response. We, when we changed the law in 2005, we said that demand, when there were severe drought conditions in the main system, generators could tell demand to pay, to pay them for reducing their consumption. Unfortunately, this was beautifully written in the law, but there were no uh, intelligent metering. There was no uh, way of really making this work. And although there were offers on the papers by generators, if you reduce your consumption, I will pay you for it. It really didn't work because there was no way of, of, of accounting for it and really controlling it. So it really faded away. Some distribution companies have started uh, the, in the, uh, integrating demand response, but essentially for their own purpose. They have contracts. They have capacity payments to pay. If, if, they, if they surpass, if they go over their capacity demand, they will have to pay for more. So they want some control of their demand so as not to over peak over their, over their contracts. And we have remote metering is being installed. We have flexible hour tower tariffs, still very little over one million clients in, in, in Santiago. This is the distribution company of Santiago. We're really talking about small numbers, really more uh, exercises uh, of, of action. They have a smart, a smart grid, but really it's only 100 houses that are really being considered. But I mean, they're working. They're getting ready for the future. They receive the news from Europe and the US from this conference that smart grids are coming. So let's see what, what, what it means. And of course, we, we also, uh, also very much driven by environmental groups, we recently approved a net metering uh, law. It was recently approved. I don't know if it will work because there, were, there are no subsidies for that to take place. But the law is there, and people are looking for opportunities. The other areas where, of course, countries like uh, countries in South America or in Africa could benefit from these smart grid uh, developments is the development of microgrids for isolated communities. A student of mine, Mr. Rodrigo Palma, did a fantastic exercise with a small village in the north of the country uh, that was near a big uh, uh, copper mine. The copper mine paid for a, a sophisticated scheme to supply energy more than three hours a day, which they had before, 24 hours by a combination of, uh, of diesel, of, uh, of, of solar, of wind, in a, in a very small uh, community environment. Didn't talk much about smart grids or the future of the, of the network, our present problems, the challenges, very, as I said, sophisticated regulations, uh, government policy being questioned, how do you go about? A lot, of, a, lo a lot of pressure from groups saying, we don't have a policy in the country, we're not directing the market. Others say, we are. 
the market is really driving it. And if the market works, we'll go for hydro, we'll go for coal, with all the environmental requirements to comply with that. And then we'll go for gas, and then we'll go for renewables. But big discussion. Should the government intervene more? The government has realized, yes, it cannot let the market work on its own. So it's trying to make changes of law to improve transmission investment, to improve rights of ways. Uh, but, uh, but really, the question is, is, is quite open on how we will evolve into the future. Thank you very much. Yeah, beautiful uh, lecture. Thank you very much. Um, questions? <coughs> Uh, here, so just just comment, really, question and comment about your presentation about the situation in Chile. Because basically, you s you, s you said that well, the, the, the Chile started market reforms in electricity supply industry back in the 80s, and you continued with it. But if you look at the um, uh, how the market works, it's not really a market because what you have, you have you have regulated costs. I assume this much. So LMPs are de uh, derived based on re on audited costs, which means people are not free to beat whatever they want, are they? Well, that, that, that is the, the Chilean market has often been questioned that it's not a market because the spot market is based on audited cost. What I'm saying to you is the market is not there. The, mar the market is on the, on the contracts. And the, the contract market is fully competitive. And you pay what you agree. You, you go for an auction as a generator, and you, you, offer, you offer a bid so many dollars per megawatt hour and with an indexing uh, element into the future. You will get awarded if you are a good competitor and offer a good price amongst other competitors, and you will sign that contract with the, with the, with the distribution company. If you want to go for a, for, for, for a large mining consumer, 400, 500, 700 megawatt loads uh, that, uh, that incorporate uh, the port, the, the desalinization, which beca has become an important load, and of course the mining industry, you, 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 you negotiate, and the, 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 the competition is I there. I understand. The, 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 the spot market at the end is only for the balances. Mm -hmm. It's only for the balances. So that, I agree with you, it's not a market. It's not sophisticated. It's just a cost base. As in theory, a, a competitive market would work where cost would be used. Yeah, so, so you have basically regulated market, if market at all, in, 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 the, in the spot. And the same with the capacity payment. Also, there are basically calculations done. There's no market bidding. So the market is only long term supply signing of the uh, PPA. So, so that's why. Yes, let me explain that better. In essentially, yes, we agreed that the capacity market, instead of bidding, would have a regulated price, which is calculated by the government, and essentially is, a, is the cost of a peaking unit, a 60 megawatt uh, gas turbine, a peaking unit, how much would it cost in investment? And that is regulated. And of course, second, the, the, assi the assignment of capacity contributions to generator is also regulated through a, a model that is done by the system operator. So clearly, we don't have a market there either. Yeah, so, th so my question is really following, because basically, w I come from Britain, and, and the main problem in, in Britain, there's now electricity market reform going on, and that was from realization that the true market will never deliver low carbon electricity because it's simply too expensive. Uh, uh, markets really aim at minimizing the cost, and that is clear contribution to low, achieving low carbons. So that means that because your market is fully regulated, that means there's, it will be relatively easy to meet low carbon uh, requirements to add even more regulation to, to ensure that all, all that happened, if it wasn't for public opposition. So is the public opposition the only thing which, which prevents Chile to engage more renewables? Or because as I say, there's no problem with the market. Market is not an obstacle to it. So what's your comment on the, that? The, well, in relation to... Um, uh, emissions, uh, CO2 emissions, the country has analyzed in the past the idea of introducing some kind of taxes into that. But of course, we, do, we will be doing that very un unilaterally, as we know worldwide this is not a case, and now in, in, in the Emirates, uh, they are discussing about how, what actions will be taken in relation to climate change, so there is clearly not much co uh, commitment to investment. So it'd be really very much against us if we introduce uh, a CO2 uh, tax, but of course it could be it could be an easily introduced element by the by the by the by the regulator. If the change of law could be, and we we could tax the coal plants and, and, and gas plants for with that. But really, I don't think it will be done because it'll, if we have expensive electricity nowadays, it'd be crazy to go that way. Uh, really, the the difficulty for renewables to get into the market is essentially one of financing. Uh, because you, you want to contract, uh, you want a contract to ask a bank to finance it, 
and really you, 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 no, no consumer will contract with an independent uh, renewable company because uh, it will have to contract with somebody else to supply the, the difference. Let's look at the solar. How will the other be supplied? So therefore, there are problems with contracting of, 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 of renewables. We don't have any regulation or enforcing a feed-in tariff to, to make it work. And, and that's how essentially what has limited more growth. Although we are fulfilling our, uh, our uh, quota uh, objectives. Just a clarification question about the long-term market. Uh, who, who is buying this? Just the distribution companies or you allow big consumers to buy all, also? All consumers over 2 megawatts are non-regulated. That means they have to sign contracts with, with third parties without any price regulation. So, but it's, uh, they must have the long-term contracts also? If, if you don't have a long-term contract, you will not have energy. You but don't have access to the spot market. Uh, uh, do, you have, do you have the possibility of trading the contracts among uh, the consumers? You could, but it's not, it's not, the, it's not the practice. Essentially, lo uh, l uh, large in, uh, mining uh, projects, they look for contracts, they look for investment in new plants, and, and they agree on long-term. But they don't have, uh, they, they could, it, it, uh, as you say, a trading market could develop, it hasn't. Essentially, each one looks on its own. They have an association of large consumers who somehow tries to coordinate them, but essentially each of them has to find its own supply and agree on a price with whatever. So you're saying that the secondary market is like a bilateral? Uh, no, no, no. There's nothing arranged in that direction. Okay. Any questions? Oh, yes, sir. I fully concur with your comment, and if I, 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 I believe Chile has done the worldwide electricity industry tremendous service. The, it is easy to design a spot market when you have perfect market conditions. But as we all know, as we go into the future, an uh, imperfect market condition is the more, much more demanding challenging. So even though you, you didn't do the quote unquote fully priced capabilities, uh, the fact you, this, this is the first comment, I'll to comment and then I have a question following this. So I think the whole scheme of designing a reformed electricity structure that takes into account economics and practical consideration is an art, and this art is executed beautifully in Chile, so congratulations. Right. And the second question I have is, in, along the line, on the, uh, if you can explain uh, what's happening, also what's your opinion regarding uh, renewables. The, I don't know the exact wording, but there's a penalty imposed for not meeting certain renewable integration standards. Is that, is that, uh, is, a, is a renewable performance internalized by the market participants, or is that a responsibility of the ISO? And what is your opinion about going forward? The responsibility for renewables, in theory, is, uh, is, is that of the, gener of, of the marketers, the one that contracts with are essentially the generators. Generators who sell energy to consumers being uh, regulated consumers or non-regulated, uh, meaning distribution companies or large industrial consumers. It is generators who have to comply, and it is the ISO who looks at them complying. Uh, essenti uh, so essentially what generators do is do they look for renewables, for contracting renewables, essentially for their distribution consumers, for the distribution contracts. For the large industrial contracts, unfortunately, they are telling the consumers, you, you try to solve the problem. So some of the mining industry has now gone into stimulating renewable uh, development. There was, for example, Koyawasi from Magistrata stimulated the, build, the building of a, of a solar photovoltaic plant so for, to, to be able to contribute that part of the energy, renewable energy needed. Okay? Yeah, I'm afraid we've run out of time, but uh, okay. great discussion. Thank, uh, thank, thank you. Thank you.